The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it is found in 2 Corinthians chapters 6 and 7. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and will walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst to be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, since... We have these promises, beloved. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we are many weeks now into our exposition of 2 Corinthians, and uh, we've, uh, since Easter, been really at the pinnacle of Paul's argument. Uh, In the end of chapter 5, we have the theological center point, and uh, now we have the exhortational center point. Uh, So this is where the rubber meets the road. Let's pray that the Lord would enable us to hear and then heed the call of the gospel as it is laid out for us here in 2 Corinthians. Father, we do pray that very thing. Open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things in your word. Equip us and strengthen us that we might walk in such a manner as... um, as holiness is completed in us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The magisterial reformer John Calvin was born in 1509, about 90 miles north of the city of Paris. He was educated in a small uh, Brethren of Common Life school and uh, then went to study in the universities of Paris and Orléans. He, as a student, embraced the humanistic movement of Erasmus, and by 1532, following the publication of his dissertation, a commentary on Seneca, uh, that he was widely regarded as a rising star among a new generation of humanist scholars. His first job after completing his dissertation was to serve as a writer and a researcher for Nicholas Kopp, who was the canon of the University of Paris and of Notre Dame uh, Cathedral. But having embraced uh, Luther's ideas, both men were forced to flee the city. Calvin was lowered from his window on bed sheets tied together, a la the Apostle Paul. Um, and uh, for nearly three years, he wandered as a fugitive evangelist under assumed names. He escaped from the city of Paris, uh, ironically dressed as a farmer with a hoe over his shoulder. It's not exactly the picture of Calvin that we <laughs> normally have. Uh, in 1536, he visited the city of Geneva, intending just to spend one night on his way to Strasbourg, where he hoped he might be able to continue his studies and uh, to solidify his theology. But uh, William Farrell and Pierre Viret apprehended him at the end, and uh, with uh, fulminations from uh, uh, Farrell and uh, 
and wooing from Vire, they convinced him to stay. And though there was a short interlude when he was away from the city, the presence of Calvin in Geneva was transformative. Geneva quickly became the epicenter of the burgeoning Reformation with Calvin's uh, profound theological insight and his rich devotional piety. His greatest bequest to the church in future ages would be his great work, The Institutes of Christian Religion. It would eventually grow over his lifetime to 60 chapters long. A fine theological reasoning. Uh, But uh, when he first arrived in Geneva, he had just published the first edition of it, and it was only six chapters long. But his experience as a pastor in Geneva convinced him that he was really missing something. The doctrine was solid. But the question was, how do you implement that doctrine in life? What does holiness look like? What does faithfulness look like? What does obedience look like in the ordinary Christian? How do you live a life of prayer in the midst of the hustle and bustle of the world? And so Calvin undertook the writing of several additional chapters. And they have always been cherished as the most beautiful of all of Calvin's writings. They're published in a little volume simply entitled a little book on the Christian life. In it, he said, the goal of God's work in us is to bring our lives into harmony and agreement with his own righteousness. And so to manifest to ourselves and to others our true identity as his adopted children. In a sense, that's the whole message that Paul wants to drive home to the Corinthians here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In chapters 3, 4, and 5 of his letter, the Apostle Paul lays out the promises and the consequences of the whole gospel for the whole of life. He portrays the beauty of the gospel and it culminates in chapter 5, verse 21, when he declares, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The purpose of our redemption is not simply to save us from hell. It's not to make us nicer people. It's to enable us to become the righteousness of God. Immediately after this, the Apostle Paul lays out three exhortations in light of this glorious gospel truth. First, He says in the first two verses of chapter 6, don't waste this glorious bequest. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. And then in the next 11 verses, he says, in light of this glorious gospel, love with wide open hearts. Now, Concluding chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, and then in the first verse of chapter 7, he gives a final exhortation. Flee from idolatry and complete your sanctification. In verse 14, he, he begins this exhortation simply by saying, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. The verb that's used here is used nowhere else in the New Testament. It's highly unusual. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, it is used in Leviticus chapter 19 and Deuteronomy chapter 22, where we have prohibitions of yoking unlike animals together, oxen with donkeys. 
Paul uses this metaphor uh, to, uh, to drive home the truth that God's people are called out. We are peculiar people. We're distinctive people. Our lives are to show it. We're not to be unequally yoked. Now, a lot of times, in fact, I would say probably most of the time, uh, this is something that is applied to dating and marriage. But that's not all that Paul has in mind. John Calvin, in his commentary, uh, commentary on uh, 2 Corinthians, says this. Many think to hear that Paul is speaking only of marriage, but the context clearly shows uh, that uh, he intends something far, far more. And the metaphor from the Old Testament law is designed to drive home the truth that we are to be distinct. Paul is speaking about the yoke of ungodliness, about participation in actions which Christians cannot and must not share. Under this prohibition, marriage certainly also falls, but Paul's teaching here is too broad to be restricted just to marriage. His subject here is the avoidance of idolatry. He is beckoning us to flee and to lay hold of righteousness. Paul, following this exhortation, that does not remind us of all the things that he's already reminded uh, the Corinthians. Things like, Uh, We're to engage unbelievers in hospitality. We're to invite unbelievers into worship. Uh, We're to exercise evangelism. If if we're in a marriage where one is a believer and the other is not, uh, we're not to separate. All of those are laid out in Paul's first letter. So he's not saying here, okay, that you're Christians now, separate yourself entirely from the world. In, In fact, he tells Uh, the Corinthians and 1 Corinthians, if you were to do that, you would have to go out of the world. Instead, uh, what he intends is very evident from five rhetorical and antithetical questions uh, that he asks, uh, beginning here in verse 14. What partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? Well, none, obviously. Well, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Again, none. Verse 15, what accord is there between Christ and Belial? Belial is just another name for Satan. It was a popular word, oftentimes used in the Dead Sea Scrolls. What accord does Christ have with Satan? Uh, Not any. Uh, What portion does a believer have with an unbeliever? In other words, what inheritance have you received spiritually that an unbeliever has also received? None. Verse 16. uh, What agreement is there between the sanctuary of God and idols? Or uh, what agreement is there between the temple... And idolatry, again, absolutely none. Paul concludes uh, these five questions with a declaration. We are the temple of the living God. He's reminding them of what he's already told them in 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and 6. Remember in chapter 6, he says, But your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. And in chapter 3, he reminds them that the whole community, the whole body, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And notice the, the language. He says, not only are you the temple, but you're the temple of the living God. Uh, This is a technical name uh, that Paul only uses in Romans chapter 9, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and 1 Timothy chapter 3, and here, to draw the distinction between deaf and dumb idols 
and the one true living God, the King of kings and the Lord of all lords. Paul is saying, look, you know why you're different? You're different because God has set you apart. He's given you life and he has put his name on you. You're the temple of the living God. He follows this now with a chain of five Old Testament quotations. He wants to drive home this point. The first two are from Leviticus chapter 26 and Ezekiel chapter 37. Both passages begin with prohibitions against idolatry and end with incredible promises. Paul lays out the promises. God will make his dwelling among his people. He will walk with them. He will be their God and they will be his people. Chapter 17, we have two more quotations from Isaiah 52 and Ezekiel chapter 20. Again, the passages begin with prohibitions against idolatry and end with a series of promises. Promises related to the restoration of God's people from their exile. He will restore them and they will then be able to go out of the midst of the people that have held them captive. They will be separate. They will be clean. And God himself will welcome them. The fifth quotation is in verse 18 from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, There uh, we have the same pattern. Prohibition against idolatry and then glorious promises. I will be a father to you. And you will be sons and daughters to me. Now it's really interesting, in all five passages, uh, there's another element that is really unique. They note that the nations will see this special relationship that God has with his people. They will see it, and they will know that God is the Lord. Paul's reminding them that from the beginning of the Old Testament, when God calls a people, he sets his name upon them, and they then become a declaration to the world. They become a trophy of grace. These these are great promises laid out in these five quotations. Paul is applying these Old Testament passages to the Corinthians so that they can see that the people of God are his people. Uh, Secondly, that he dwells with them and walks with them. Third, uh, that he puts his name on them. Fourth, uh, that he makes them distinct from the world. And fifth, that he bears witness to a fallen world through them. See what Paul's doing here? He's taking the incredible, glorious gospel. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin for our sake, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Why did he make us the righteousness of God? So that people would know that we are his own, that he walks with us, that he dwells with us, that he's put his name upon us, and that he bears witness to the world through us. So Paul then says in chapter 7, verse 1, the big conclusion, since we have these promises, my beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. I want you to notice several things about the language that Paul uses here. First of all, did you notice the intimacy? All of a sudden, 
uh, Paul stops preaching and starts loving. Did you see that? He calls them my beloved. This is not language that he often uses of the Corinthians. Only one other time does he call them beloved. He tells them he loves them, but now he calls them by their most intimate name in Christ. My beloved. Secondly, did you notice the inclusive language? Again, Paul has stopped preaching here. He says, let us. Let's cleanse ourselves. He includes himself. He uses the first person, not the second person. He's not pointing his finger. He's saying, what what a gospel. Shouldn't it change us? Shouldn't, change, shouldn't it change everything about us? And third, notice how comprehensive the language is. Uh, the call to holiness is a call to cleanse body and spirit. This is a passionate call to sanctification. Bringing holiness to completion. In the fear of God. Christians are the people of God. He dwells with us. He walks with us. He's put his name upon us. He's made us distinct from the world. However hard we try to fit in, however hard we try and squeeze ourselves into the mold of this world, he has made us distinct. First Peter chapter 1, that we have this great call to holiness. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Hebrews chapter 12, without holiness, no one will see God. Does that terrify you like it terrifies me? 2 Timothy chapter 1, he saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and his grace. 1 Peter chapter 2, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We don't hear a lot about holiness in the Christian world these days. We hear a lot about wholeness and a whole lot about brokenness. We hear a whole lot about how to be the best we can be, how we can have great marriages and great kids and great prosperity and get out of debt and all of the rest. But the call to walk in holiness, the object of our redemption is that he made him who knew no sin to be sin for our sakes so that we might be the righteousness of God in the world. That's our identity. That's our calling. In the Old Testament, there is a very famous blessing. It's called the Aaronic Benediction. It's the blessing that Moses commanded the Levites to speak over the people of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. It's Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. The blessing seems to always stop there. Every time I've ever heard it pronounced, it stops there. I always want to think, So what's wrong with verse 27? Is it chopped liver? What? What's the deal? (laughs) Verse 27 says, So they will put my name on the Israelites. 
and I will bless them. I will know them, and I will show them to the world. The world will know that they are my people, that I dwell with them, that I walk with them, that I've put my name upon them, that I've made them distinct, that I use them to bear witness. I urge you, therefore, brethren, the Apostle Paul concludes his great argument in Romans chapter 12. I urge you, therefore, brethren, present your bodies as living and holy sacrifices. Acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. But do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. Calvin sums it up in his little book on the Christian life this way. We have been adopted by the Lord as his children with this understanding that in our lives we should mirror Christ who is the bond of our adoption. And truly, unless we are devoted, even addicted to righteousness we will faithlessly abandon our Creator and disown Him as our Savior day after day after day. The great high call of the gospel is that the whole of life be transformed. I want you to notice, Paul makes it clear that sanctification is a process. We don't like processes. We want instant results. We want microwave holiness. But Paul says, let's bring this to completion. Let's run the race well. After all, we're the people of God. He dwells with us. He walks with us. He's put his name upon us. He's made us distinct. And he shows the world his power and his love and his majesty through us. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.